Welcome back to Config Day 2. I am so excited to meet all of you, and although you've heard it many more times, I'll say it once more, we are so happy that you are here. My name is Alex. I'm an engineering manager here at Figma, but more importantly, I am here as your host for the second half of the day. Uh, my first order of business as host is to do a vibe check. How are we all feeling? <laughs> nice. It seems that lunch has not led to any lethargy, which I'm excited about. Uh, so let's use that energy and catapult into this next round of talks. Uh, this next talk I have the privilege of introducing is by the Duolingo Max team. They're here to chat a little bit about how they built a fast-moving product, uh, incorporating the release of GPT-4. Duolingo's story is one of embracing AI, pushing boundaries, and building really, really quickly, all while prioritizing the needs of their users. I'm hoping we can learn a ton about how we might each individually incorporate AI into our future products from this talk. So we're going to watch a little video, but after that, please welcome to the stage Edwin and Megan. Get the most advanced language learning yet with Duolingo Max. All the benefits of Super Duolingo plus new features powered by artificial intelligence. Understand mistakes better with Explain My Answer, AI-powered explanations designed to level up your learning. Practice conversations with Roleplay, an interactive AI experience that puts your real-world language skills to the test. Level up with the most advanced language learning yet. Duolingo Max. Hello, everyone. My name is Edwin. I'm a product manager at Duolingo. And I'm Megan, a product designer. And we're both part of the team that brought to life Duolingo Max. Today we're going to be talking all about Duolingo Max, our newest and highest tier subscription, powered by OpenAI's GPT-4. But before we start, we want to talk a little bit about what we're actually going to get to today. First one is the lessons that we've actually learned working with this brand new technology. The second is around the differentiation that we tried putting into our new product, especially in this new AI landscape that's been evolving day by day. And the third point that I want to make sure we start with is understanding that the two of us are not experts, or at least we're not experts in AI. We're just two people who happen to be a part of a design process that's going to help us rethink the way we approach education products in the future. And we hope that what we tell you today is going to be able to inform your team's playbook as you start experimenting with generative AI for your product. But before we get into Max, it's important for you to understand what Duolingo is all about. We are the worldwide leader in language education, with over 500 million learners studying 100 plus courses daily, from English, Spanish, French, and Japanese, all the way to High Valyrian or Klingon. And while I'm learning French and Edwin's pretty advanced at Spanish, neither of us know High Valyrian or Klingon, and that we'll not be speaking that today. You might also recognize Duo the Owl from some other places online, pestering you day and night to finish your lessons and even threatening to show up on the back door if you don't. <laughs> Our mission is to develop the best education in the world and make it universally available. Our vision is to reduce economic inequality through education. And to make that possible, all of our content on Duolingo is completely free. Learners can make it through an entire course without ever having to pay a cent. Monetization at Duolingo exists for the very important purpose of fueling that mission. Our Super Duolingo and now Duolingo Max subscription tiers allow us to hire more talented people, teach more courses, and ultimately teach those courses better to our millions of learners. AI in general is also not new to us. It's always been an integral part of our strategy, allowing us to improve our teaching methods in scalable and impactful ways from nudging learners in the right moment when they're most likely to have five minutes to complete their lesson, to personalizing which lessons we show each individual learner, and surfacing mistakes at moments we know that they need to practice them. However, advancements in AI, and specifically generative AI, have forced us to approach the technology differently and start thinking about how we can build products and experiences with an AI-first approach 
rather than using, just using it to supplement our existing product. And that's what brings us to Duolingo Max and the beginning of our story today. So with that, Edwin's going to take you back in time to September 2022. So back in September, I got this calendar invite from our CEO, Luis Fanon, for 8 AM on a Monday morning which uh, you could imagine could either be a really good or a really terrible thing. <laughs> and it was fortunate that this time actually ended up being a really great thing. It was our first look at GPT-4, which was OpenAI's newest and unreleased model, which they had codenamed DV at the time for DaVinci. And what Luis did was just put in a pretty simple prompt to this little chatbot UI that we now know looks like ChatGPT, which was write a story about a girl from Guatemala, where he's from, who dreams of being an astronaut. And it spit out this multi-paragraph story that started with the lush mountains in Guatemala, this village called La Esperanza, and this, and this kind-hearted girl named Flor. And this was not something that immediately blew my mind. We had seen stuff like this with GPT-3 and maybe even GPT-2, previous models where it could generate a story. But then those iterations and some of these follow-up questions that we started asking it gave us a hint as to how powerful it actually could be. So for instance, one thing that's really applicable for language learning is rewrite this at a more beginner level. So for instance, if you're learning French or whatever language you might be learning, it's important to try and take that back into a digestible format where you actually might be able to understand it. And this was something where GPT-4 pretty successfully was able to do this. So in a small village in Guatemala, there was a kind girl named Flor. Simple grammar construction, able to actually simplify that language, which we had never seen a model do before. We started trying to do a few other fun things. So for instance, maybe you want to target very specific vocabulary. So for instance, include the word chili cheese dog in this sentence, which of course, GPT-4 we found, is able to do a pretty similar thing. So where they're famous for chili cheese dogs, there was a kind girl named Floor. And it was able to do this in a really seamless way. This was something where if we wanted to target a very specific vocabulary word for a learner, and this is a really terrible example of that, you would be able to actually slip it in and help them practice that vocab. We tried some more things. Duolingo's brand is super important to us. We want to be able to kind of highlight certain features of our characters. And if you saw the talk earlier, you learned a little bit about our character, Lily. And it's able to do this really well. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spare all of you and my sister watching at home from me trying to actually read this out loud. But as you can say, it, it's, it's able to do this really well. We tried a few more that are maybe a little bit on the nose with uh, language learning. So for instance, translating into Spanish, which is pretty simple, but it does give that nice little susperos calientes con chili y queso, kind of a fun little translation of that word. But then trying a few other things that maybe look a bit more like a tutor. So for instance, maybe we are confused about that final concept at the end, Nina amable. And you're under, trying to understand, well, why is it that the adjective is coming after the noun in Spanish? And on its own, it can do a pretty good job of actually contrasting that with English, which it knows is the language you're learning from. The last thing, just to kind of round out some of the demos we did that morning, was around actually just creating some multiple choice exercises to test your evaluation. And I'm now beating this example down, but once again, it's tomatoes for the uh, chili cheese dogs. So Luis and I, we had this great uh, meeting at 8 AM on a Monday. We go through these demos, and after playing with it and realizing that it's really good at replicating natural speech, it's really good at creating these multiple choice questions, explaining concepts to you, Luis just turned to me and said one thing. Pivot your team immediately. This is going to transform education. For years and years, we've had gaps in our product that we've really wanted to solve, as if we could just plop a tutor right down in front of a bunch of our learners. But that just wasn't a feasible solution. That's incredibly expensive and especially not accessible for a lot of our learners all around the world. And as Megan mentioned, Duolingo has built a lot of AI models on our own. We have a lot of proprietary data. And we've been able to create a lot of models that help us choose different exercises for the learner. But this technology that could replicate maybe like tutor-like quality instructions, we thought was about four to five years away. And that morning, back in September, is when we started to realize that we were actually there today. We knew this technology was going to start making its way into every product we have at Duolingo. And that's also something we're really dedicated to, of making sure that generative AI is going to hit every single product that Duolingo releases. We saw a lot of potential in the product. And instead of starting with trying to actually just integrate into other existing products, we saw a ton of potential in actually just building a few new products completely from the ground up. Sometimes you see a technology that's just so transformative that you have to completely rethink your strategy. And so we jumped right in with Duolingo Max. Dueling, luckily, GPT-4 is a lot cheaper than, for instance, a real human tutor. But it's still actually pretty expensive, especially when you start thinking about the millions of learners that have, Duolingo has on its app every single day. So we knew that we'd have to actually put it in the monetization area, which is where Megan and I and a number of other people work, 
trying to understand how we could generate this product at something that would actually not just completely run us out of cash. Uh, we also were really enthralled with this idea of a higher tier subscription. And if you've looked at other maybe comparable subscription apps, a lot of apps have had a lot of good luck with this. You have maybe a good, better, best, maybe a free, a super, and then a max tier. But we just never found that feature we thought could cornerstone the higher tier subscription until now. By October, so just a little couple weeks later, we had our marching orders. In March of 2023, OpenAI was going to go public with their launch of GPT-4, and we'd, be make sure, we'd make sure to be right next to them with our launch of Duolingo Max. This gave us just about five months to build two new brand new features completely from the ground up, an entire subscription tier to house the product. It was a small team of only about 10 or so dedicated engineers, designers, animators, illustrators, data scientists, but it was an incredibly motivated and talented team, and especially motivated to try and get this product out incredibly quickly driven by how much potential we saw in the product. The Max team was born, and we were off to the races. And that's going to bring us to our first product lesson of the day, one of five, which is you haven't won yet. This is very similar to one of our Duolingo operating principles that we live by every day, which is we haven't won yet. But I guess now we're just applying it to you all. The quick turnaround from that GPT-4 demo to actually building a team and staffing it and trying to ship a product super quickly shows this in practice. No matter how successful you are, and we'd of course like to think at Duolingo, we've had some successes in the past, you have to keep innovating to stay ahead of new technology. So we now had this extremely powerful technology, and we needed to figure out how we would actually put it in our learners' hands. And as a company of language and tech nerds, we were originally really excited about the open-ended nature of it. We spent hours in the early days playing with the demo, asking it a ton of questions, and getting some pretty smart responses. We asked it to generate language concepts for us, like write three funny sentences with this certain expression at a specific proficiency level. And I mean, I joined a cult by accident, but they have great snacks. It's not half bad. We also had it generate things like TV scripts with characters that could reflect the personalities of our Duolingo characters. The bored, deadpan teenage girl being our character Lily, and Grouchy Bear being Falstaff. We also had it rewrite song lyrics in ridiculous ways, like this incredible version of Don't Stop Believing that's subtly a Quiznos ad. I mean, this is so good, Quiznos really needs to adopt this. And we asked GPT-4 what features should Duolingo build with GPT-4. And what it spit out, this idea of a personalized AI tutor, is definitely the most obvious solution. We could create some version of a tutor that learners could ask questions to at any point and get answers pretty quickly. And as designers, it's natural to want to model the products and experiences we build off of things we're familiar with in the world around us. The way that we all interact with large language models right now is through some version of an open-ended interface. And that's why so many of the generative AI products you see on the market today are some version of a chatbot. And this is not always a bad thing. But we knew that a completely open-ended interface for our product wasn't going to work. So let's look at this potentially open-ended interface, where all we're just saying is, ask me anything. We knew pretty early on this was just not going to create a really sticky Duolingo product. And there are three main reasons for that. The first one is we've done a lot of research where we've understood that when you ask a learner, well, what can I help you with, they tend to have maybe two or three really good examples. But after they ask, you know, how to explain the past tense, or maybe how do I conjugate this verb, they just tend to run out of things to ask. And kind of relying on them to create all the questions really doesn't create a sticky experience. A second point that might drive this home is if we think more about maybe a tennis coach and my favorite player at all. A really good tennis coach isn't just going to sit and watch practice happen. They're just going to let you hit a really bad backhand for a while and just say, hey, like, come up and ask me questions. They're going to pause practice, and they're going to stop the doll and say, hey, your backhand's terrible, and let's go hit like 30 more backhands, or maybe tweak the way that you're holding the racket, and let's, let's try and change that up. Very similar to that, a language tutor has to be proactive, and their language ha tutor has to actually know and have an opinion about what they want the learner to do. AI products need to have an opinion about what they want the user to do. Sorry, I read that wrong. AI products need to have an opinion rather than requiring the user to know what to ask. 
the onus is on us, Duolingo, or maybe you as developers, because you have a wealth of knowledge of data or mistakes or habits of your learners, and need to, of course, make sure that you're, the onus is on you to tell them what you're actually trying to accomplish. They should never be staring at some sort of bar that just says, ask me anything. Because for the most part, they're going to have a hard time actually knowing what they want. And so we have to formulate that for them. We never want them just staring at that empty response bar. The third point for all of this was recognizing that everyone's going to have access to this in a certain amount of time. This technology was just going to become ubiquitous. And that's, of course, come true, as we've seen that ChatGPT was one of the quickest downloaded consumer products of all time. We had to find product differentiation. And in order to do that, we had to turn to what we knew best, which were the, learn the needs of our learners. That brings us to our second product lesson of the day, which is just find your product's unique edge. With this universally accessible technology, you can't just treat AI as a commodity. You have to leverage it in your own way to find your unique project, product's edge. So to find that unique edge, we had to work a little bit backwards compared to our typical product design process at Duolingo. Normally, we start with a learner need or pain point, and then we figure out what product or tech solution we can use to solve for it. This time, we were starting with a tech solution, but it was so powerful that we knew it would unlock all these learner needs that we had tried to solve for in the past but had run into roadblocks with, like content scaling being too difficult or human labor costs being too high. So the questions we had to ask ourselves were what user needs should we focus on and how would we use generative AI to solve them? And through years of research at Duolingo, we knew our learners very well and really deeply understood their pain points and needs. We identified four that we thought GPT-4 might be able to help solve. We knew our learners wanted to better understand grammar and language rules from their lessons. They wanted to improve speaking and pronunciation skills, and they wanted to feel more prepared for real-world conversations. When you're new to learning a language and you only have a few basic phrases that you know, like the cat is black, or the boy likes dogs, or the monkey is on the branch, it's really hard to go to a place like Paris and buy a train ticket, or order a coffee, or ask somebody where the toilet is. We also knew our learners wanted to have a better understanding over their progress in our courses and wanted to have some idea of what their proficiency level actually was. We knew our learners well, but we didn't yet understand the ins and outs of GPT-4. So to become more familiar with the technology, we decided to run a one-week team hackathon to become more familiar, where we asked GPT-4 to do things like generate learning exercises. And this is something we kind of had an idea it did well based on the demo, but when we really dove into it, we found that it was pretty successful in generating these. We also asked it to become a conversation partner with us, giving it a specific role, like you're a taxi driver, and a scenario, like you're driving me to the airport then having it go back and forth with us in whatever language we specified. And this was also pretty successful. We also tried giving it a specific mistake that we made in one of our lessons on Duolingo and had it explain to us what we did wrong. But not just explain what the mistake was, but really dive into the language rules and concepts behind that. And this was also pretty successful. We also tried giving it a ton of data from our lessons and seeing if it could provide any insights, like, here's 15 mistakes. Tell me generally what are the things I'm doing wrong. And we found, at least at first, this was a little bit less successful. The answers it gave back were pretty vague, not super actionable. And while we saw a lot of potential in this, we knew it would take a lot more work to actually get right. So after the hackathon, we brought the whole team together in Pittsburgh, where Duolingo is headquartered. And this photo is a little bit misleading. Uh, Edwin lives in Pittsburgh. Does it actually look this nice all the time? Every day. Every day of the year. <laughs> Sunny. Sure, sure. We did have a beautiful week uh, during the design sprint, though, so there's that. At the beginning of the sprint, Christina, who led US, UX research on our team, I see you're there, hi, Christina, <laughs> kept our focus on the learner needs that we identified. And based on the hackathon explorations, we now had an idea of what GPT-4 was particularly suited to help us solve. 
We knew it could explain language concepts and rules well, so we could help our learners understand their grammar. And it was a great conversation partner, and we could use that to help our learners feel more prepared for real-world conversations, and potentially work on their speaking and pronunciation skills in the process. We then dove into FigJam, which we love, hashtag ad, and started generating ideas. The hackathon had allowed us to understand and make a few assumptions of what was possible, but we wanted to explore all possibilities and figure out how we could actually bring that to life in the product. At the end of our design sprint, we had sign off from Luis and other key stakeholders to build two new features powered by GPT-4 and aimed at these learner needs we identified. The first, which we called Explain My Answer, would give learners personalized mistake explanations uh, from their lessons. And the second, called Role Play, would allow learners to act out a variety of different scenarios so that they could practice for real-world conversations. And that brings us to product lesson three. To find your unique edge, marry technical possibility with core user needs. So let's dive in a little bit to how we actually built the Role Play feature. The goal of this, of course, was to emulate real-world conversation, but that could take so many different forms, especially with this new technology. We started following what's kind of our normal design process at Duolingo, at least pre-generative AI, where we would define learner needs, and as Megan and Christina did, we were pretty clear on those. We started actually trying to outline what were those learning objectives we were targeting for the learner. So for instance, maybe we wanted to target something specific, like let's order a cup of coffee, or maybe target something a little more open-ended around let's practice their speaking abilities. And then from there, we dove into FigJam, once again our best friend, and we started trying to actually explore what those solutions could look like. And early on, we had this concept that we actually really, really were into, and we pushed forward pretty quickly with some high-fidelity designs. This concept was basically taking an ordinary scenario. For instance, you walk into a Parisian cafe and want to order some coffee, and splitting it into three different sub-goals, which you see there up in the gamified progress bar. For instance, maybe this could look like the first task being greet the barista and tell him your name, the second one looking something like order your coffee, and the third one being ask for cash or credit to pay. And we really like this for a few reasons, and that's why we jumped into high-fidelity wireframes to start. The first one was it added a lot of structure to the conversation. Remember we were saying earlier about those beginner learners who make up a lot of our app? We want to kind of direct the conversation for them. And maybe we have that particular learning that we want them to order with you know, cash or credit and tell the, learner, the, the barista that. We wanted to make sure we could direct the conversation in a way that used vocabulary that they knew and also could help them test out if they were able to actually do that in this real world scenario. The second thing that we wanted to do here was just keep the conversation on the rails a little bit. And I'm sure you have all played a little bit with GPT, and it's very fun. It can do all sorts of crazy stuff. But we are trying to you know, keep too many screenshots of Eddie saying some wacko stuff from getting onto our Reddit. Uh, so we ended up kind of trying to keep the conversation a bit more constrained. We were really, really excited about this direction. We actually you know, jumped in and had very high fidelity mocks that we showed even our CEO. But as soon as we started actually testing the prompt for this, we started realizing it just wasn't going to work. And I'll stick this up here for a second, and you can maybe start to understand what parts didn't really work with this. <laughs> so a few things. First off, they're asking your name, and you say something like, I want a coffee with ketchup. Weird thing to say, for sure. But if you're a beginner at learning French or Japanese or whatever it is, you probably thought you said, I want a coffee with milk, and you just completely messed up the word. So in this case, we would really want GPT to kind of respond well to the learner and maybe say, oh, that's a weird thing to say. And they understand maybe in context they've said something a little strange. But instead, the bot's kind of just stuck on that first objective. And they've decided, well, I don't really care what you just said. I still don't know your name. I'm just going to keep asking you, what's your name? That goes on. You said, do you have bread? It says, what's your name? And you get the point. This continues for a long time. The thing we started realizing is that we were trying to define how a human conversation would go a few turns in advance. Even though it would help us kind of constrain the vocabulary they would use, we were predefining what that conversation would look like and completely taking all the agency away from the learner. We also were realizing that we just weren't going to create that wow moment that we had replicated in that earlier demo we had seen with Luis. So what we ended up doing was just stripping out a ton of this scaffolding and this, these rigid instructions to create something that looked a little more like this. For instance, 
you go to Paris and you meet up with our character, Lily, who's that sassy teenage girl. She asks you how you're spending your first night. And if you were to say something open-ended, like, I want a McDonald's cheeseburger, then you should probably get a little bit of lip. And she'll say something like, mandu, like, try a bistro instead. We wanted to make sure that whatever interaction we were giving the learner, it was able to showcase kind of the weird and wacky nature that GPT-4 could bring to the table. And by over-constraining the problem, we had completely gotten rid of that magic. One of the biggest things we started learning was that in our design process, we had to make sure that prompt validation was a lot earlier, earlier in the process than we originally thought. That meant instead of starting with those really high fidelity mocks or wireframes or designs, we needed to make sure we actually started and built some prompts in maybe the GPT interface or in a command line interface or wherever that needed to be. Another huge learning was just realizing that prompt writing is not just for technical people. It's not just for software engineers and not just for AI researchers. We have designers, PMs, data scientists, whoever, actually writing a lot of our prompts that we use today because it's really important for everybody on the team to actually understand the prompt strategy and how that can actually motivate your design UX. And that brings us to product lesson four, which is start with the prompt. Don't just jump straight into high fidelity wireframes or mocks. Even though we love Figma, we love FigJam, but make sure you take your time and actually understand what GPT can do for your use case. Two extra bonuses. The first off is if you have understood what this product and what this prompt could look like, start building a really good body of examples to help that final person, whoever is building the produ production level prompt, understand what that output should look like. And the last piece is don't forget what makes generative AI so magic, and make sure you showcase that in your final product. So we moved forward with our new approach to role play. We stripped away the idea of tasks and loosened our guardrails to allow for more open-ended conversation. We finally had an MVP that worked. Conversations were definitely more interesting. They could be slightly different on each replay. And we even built in our own custom moderation layer that would allow these conversations to not go totally off the rails if somebody actually said something problematic. We launched this version of Roleplay uh, as we, with the Duolingo Max subscription tier as GPT-4 was announced to the public back in March. Our plan was to put it in front of a smaller su subset of real users so we could see their real experience interacting with the product and find out what we needed to do to actually improve it. And generally, there was a lot of excitement. Conversation practice in general was a welcome addition to Duolingo, and learners were excited about how they could use that to work towards their language goals. However, there was still something pretty big missing. And through user research and our own company dog fooding, we identified that the main thing that Roleplay was lacking was the voice, quirk, and storytelling that makes Duolingo Duolingo. When you take a lesson on Duolingo, you take it from our cast of weird, wacky, and wonderful characters, each with their own personalities, aspirations, and relationships. Take Lily, for example, in the purple. We've talked about her a few times. She's a sassy, sarcastic, deadpan, emo teenager who doesn't get excited about much except for the weird bands that she likes. And she is very different than our character, Eddie, in the red tracksuit at the top. Eddie is super friendly, energetic, very big-hearted, but maybe not the smartest person you've ever met. And he spends a lot of his time at the gym and also raising his son, Junior, in blue at the bottom. Or take Lucy, for example, in the orange. Lucy is a grandma, and she also has a ton of experience. Name any location she's been there, name any activity, and she's done it. And she's also casually an ex-spy. <laughs> These characters show up everywhere in Duolingo. They teach you new phrases, like one of our favorite examples, uh, the most popular phrase from 2020, I am eating bread and crying on the floor, <laughs> which, accurate. <laughs> you get to read about the character's daily adventures in our very popular feature stories. But with role play, we are really excited about learners getting to interact directly with the characters for the first time. So to make these conversations more rewarding and ensure that these character personalities could really shine through, we brought two storytelling masterminds onto the team, Tim Shea, our head of content, and Cindy Berger, who is both a learning science PhD and creative writer. 
Tim created a set of principles that defined what a rewarding roleplay conversation needed to look like. It should feel relatable, engaging, and just a little bit unpredictable, with moments of surprise and delight where the character personalities could shine through. And to scale that across all of our conversations, we needed to introduce obstacles or conflicts. We wanted to create a moment or a twist that would add a little friction and drama, just like what we're used to in any good book and mo or movie. Spoiler alert, but what would Star Wars be without this big twist? <laughs> Obviously, our version of a twist or a plot twist wasn't going to have this level of drama. But the role play version of a plot twist could make these conversations much more realistic and interesting. Because honestly, everyday life is messy. Sometimes you go to a coffee shop, you order your coffee, and everything's fine. But other times, somebody budges you in line, or you spill your coffee and need to order a new one, or Edwin orders the last chocolate croissant and you're stuck with cinnamon, or you're presenting at config and your nail uh, breaks uh, <laughs> a few minutes before. Nice. <laughs> but um, our version of a, of a twist, we thought, would show up sometime in the middle of a conversation to disrupt the flow a little bit and introduce a predicament that the learner would need to respond to. Like, you're on a blind date, and things are going well, and then in the middle of the conversation, you realize you've actually been talking to the wrong person the whole time. So you need to decide whether you actually reveal your identity or lie and just keep the conversation going. Or maybe you're in a restaurant, and our character Lily is your server, and right after you order, she decides that she actually is going to quit and start a band. Maybe less normal for real life, but if you know our character Lily, that definitely tracks. The problem for us is that generative AI in GPT-4 is very deterministic, and it wouldn't introduce these types of moments on its own. We needed to find a way to get GPT-4 to inject these twists in the right moments of a conversation and follow our standards for what we thought actually made an interesting or compelling twist. And Bringing that to life meant forming collaborations our company hadn't seen before. We had our machine learning engineer, Bill, sitting right next to creative producers and writers who would outline all the components of what narratively made up a good role play or good conversation or twist so that Bill could instruct GPT-4 to generate them on its own. Tim, Cindy, and one of our PMs, Sam, figured out a way to inject character info packs into the prompts so that when GPT-4 took on the role of any of our characters, it could respond with the voice, personality, and backstory of them. And this made it possible for the same conversation between Eddie, our super friendly, energetic dude, versus Lily, our sarcastic emo teen, to look completely different. For example, let's say I'm ordering pizza from Eddie. Eddie greets me warmly, he asks me what toppings I want, and when I say I want pineapple and ham, Eddie obviously also loves Hawaiian pizza. Lily greets me a little bit less warmly, and when I say I want a pizza, I get the sarcastic, wow, how original, in response. <laughs> Lily also thinks it's pretty daring to order Hawaiian pizza. Cindy also organized a 15-person cross-functional group of learning scientists, PMs, design, machine learning engineers, creative writers, and more to come together for what we called a promptathon, where we were able to create a formula for writing scenario prompts, generate gold standard conversation and plot twist examples that we could feed GBT for, and create a rubric for ongoing prompt iteration and assessment. I think, looking at this photo at least, it's pretty safe to say that GPT-4 isn't coming for our jobs quite yet. We found it took a very large team, representing many different disciplines, to actually create a prompt that would write simple, relatable, and rewarding role-play conversation scripts at all learner proficiency levels. And that brings us to product lesson five. Generative AI is a tool for subject matter experts, not a replacement. If you're building a generative AI product, think about all the components it needs to be successful, and make sure you have an expert representing all of those with you writing the prompt. For us, that meant pulling in creative writers and learning scientists. For you, that could look totally different. 
With AI, we need to instruct and teach it how we want it to act versus getting the control of writing everything ourselves. And to teach it right, you need the right people in the room. So with the addition of our character personalities, plot twists, improved scenarios, and more, and more role plays have become much more rewarding. But to bring it back to product lesson one, we still haven't won yet. We're constantly assessing and iterating our prompts so that our character personalities can shine through even stronger. Our plot twists can feel even more compelling. And all of the conversations are more targeted at each individual learner proficiency level. Outside of the prompt, we're thinking about a bunch of different ways we can actually make role plays feel even closer to the experience of a real conversation. We're just getting started, and we have a ways to go. So that brings us to today and those five product lessons <clears throat> that we're hoping to pass on to you as you start experimenting with generative AI. The first one, you haven't won yet. Or once again, we haven't won yet. No matter how successful you may be, it's always important to just keep staying on top of recent trends and continuing to innovate to stay ahead of competition or to stay ahead of uh, new technologies. Product lessons two and three. Find your product's unique edge, and also marry technical possibility with core user needs in order to find that edge. Fourth one, start with the prompt. Don't just jump straight into high fidelity mocks or wireframes before you actually validate what AI will look like in practice for you. And once again, don't forget what makes generative AI magic, and start by building a really big body of examples of what kind of outputs you might actually want to see from your prompts. Fifth, generative AI is a tool for subject matter experts, not a replacement. And keep in mind, this is not the golden rule book for how to build a generative AI product. It's just what worked for us in this moment in time. But generative AI is going to advance rapidly, and it's important to stay on top of the latest. Host regular company hackathons, where you get a bunch of smart people in a room together, testing out the technology, seeing what's new, seeing what it can do, and thinking about other ways people could potentially disrupt you. Do something as simple as create a Slack channel, where your entire company shares the latest and greatest news in generative AI. And attend conferences like this, Listen to other teams working in this space. Learn what worked and what didn't work for them. And then think about what you can actually implement for your own team's playbook. We are just one of many, many, many teams that have been working on this, both at Duolingo and, of course, across the world. We are incredibly excited by what we think this technology can do for education. And we're going to continue to put out more and more products similar to this. We're, of course, also excited to learn what you all have been building. And so please follow us on Twitter or add us on LinkedIn. And we'd love to connect, be able to understand what you all have been building. We'll share what we've been building. And we can't wait for those conversations. Thank you all. Thank you.